All right, welcome to week 12. Um, today I start covering how to program your database. Now, a lot of people say, oh, I know how to program a database. It's called SQL. No, no, that's not programming a database. That's accessing a database and asking questions. Um, what good database systems offer is programmatic capabilities where you can extend the functionality of the database server with your own code using whatever language it offers. Um, so I'm gonna talk about store procedures, specifically how they're done in MySQL. I'll talk about functions and basically the difference between functions and store procedures. Um, at least that's the first part of today, time permitting. The other half will be talking about triggers. So a store procedure. A store procedure contains a sequence of SQL commands plus some extra stuff uh, that is stored in the database itself so that it can be invoked later by a program. Uh, they're pre-compiled, so that means they're quick to run. Um, it means that the query optimizer has always already figured out how to run these commands ahead of time so that it doesn't need to think about how to run it. Um, they act like a script. So by now you guys have learned about scripting, I hope. By now, all of you have at least written one Python script. I hope, because otherwise I don't know how you got past semester one. Um, the thing about a store procedure is they can't return a value. So, you know, in Python, you write a function, a function returns something. Store procedures don't return a value. They can include many SQL commands. Uh, including the usual select, insert, update, delete. Um, however, it does have input and output parameters. So some of you, when I say that, go, well, what was the difference between that and returning a value? An output parameter is a variable you can set partway through the code that gets passed back out, and you can have many of them. If you remember your Python functions, how many return values can you have in a Python function? One thing. Now, you can return a list or an array or an object, but you're returning one thing. In a stored procedure, you could have four inputs and four outputs. And you can set the values of the output at any point inside the stored procedure. So that basically the values get passed back out. It can call functions. It can support transactions. However, a stored procedure cannot be used in a join clause because, well, it's not a table. So you, it doesn't act like a table. It's not like a view. So I got examples, which are going to be way better than this. Uh, basically, the syntax is create, create procedure, give it the procedure name, and then you feed it the parameter specifications. And I'll be actually talking about that in a minute. Uh, then you have begin, you execute code, and it ends. So each parameter spec is a parameter name and the type. So is it an in parameter, an out parameter, or an in out parameter? In other words, value is fed in and it may be changed on the way through and it gets passed back out. Um, did you guys learn about pass by reference for functions? So most programming languages support two ways of passing in values, pass by value, pass by reference. Pass value means you pass a value in. The variable on the outside is safe because it creates a new variable on the inside that's inside scope of the function. A pass by reference means that the function can modify the value outside itself because you're passing a reference to the variable, not the actual var value. In out is basically a pass by reference. So you have a value on the outside and it will be changed on the way back out. Um, so in means, in out means it's a value being passed out. It's an output parameter. <laughs> so we have some examples. Uh, this example has two tables, an employee table and a department table. It's not a complex database. Essentially, we have a, an employee that's associated to a department number. They have a salary and a few other pieces of info. In the departments table, we have a department number and the department name. Pretty straightforward structure. So 
Let's say we want to keep track of the total salaries for the employees work for each department. Yes, we can write an SQL statement. Great. It can get slow if it's a big enterprise. In this example, it'd be instant. So what we can do though, is create the equivalent of a materialized view. So we create a table that shows the department number and the default department salary. And essentially it's gonna create, if you see that sample where it's create table depth style as, and it's a select statement. So it's basically grabbing the distinct department number and defaulting it to zero. And we end up with the table at the bottom. So now what we're gonna do is we're gonna create a procedure that updates these salaries. So step one, and this one's really important. When people are first learning how to write procedures in MySQL, and this applies to procedures, functions, and triggers. This is the, this is the one that screws everybody up. You have to tell MySQL that the semicolon is no longer end of command. So, you know, so far you learn, you know, select star from table semicolon. That's the end of the command, right? The problem is that when you're writing procedures, you're going to have multiple commands that end with a semicolon. What do you do? You tell it, by the way, MySQL, it's not semicolon anymore. We're going to determine whatever it is. In this case, the example we're using is double forward slash. A more common one that you'll see is double dollar sign. Uh, why is double dollar sign popular? It's because it's used in other database systems as a delimiter. That says, you know, everything inside double dollar sign to another double dollar sign is ignore the semicolon until you see you no know, double dollar signs again. MySQL lets you make it whatever you want it to be. Double slashes, double dollar signs, double tildes. It don't care. Inside of it. So in a moment, you'll see some more code and you'll see how that behaves. And of course, typical slide, everything is tiny. So I'm gonna read out what it does and I'll bring up the actual code so it's easier to read. So we're gonna define a procedure called update salary. It takes input as a department number. The body of the procedure is an SQL command to update the salaries and we're gonna terminate it. So now I'm gonna zoom in so that you guys can, uh, you don't need the, uh, well, there we go. We can get the whole thing pretty much on screen. Hang on, like, can I get a little bit bigger? All right. So we got the whole thing on screen. Line one, we set the delimiter to forward slashes because that's what the example decides to use. Then we create the procedure. As you can see, it's DDL. Create procedure, give it a name. And you say it's in param one. And what data type is it? So we're gonna take an inbound parameter, it's gonna be called param1, and it's gonna accept an integer. Kind of looks like a function definition in pretty much every programming language. Uh, then we have a begin block. So begin tells MySQL that the code begins here. Shocker. And then you do, there's the update statement, update department style set salary total equal to whatever the heck the command is where the department number is equal to parameter one. So param one is gonna act like a normal variable you'd see in code. Then we have our end, and you'll notice we have our happy semicolons in there because that's how we end our commands. And then we have the final double slash. The final double slash says the code is done. So at that point, MySQL will, will look, see the double slashes. It'll run everything from the moment you define the new delimiter to that double slash, it'll treat it all as if one single command, not a bunch of semicolon delimited commands. This is different than a, than a uh, transaction. Yes. It's passing it by value. They'd be in out. There's in, there's out, and in out. So it's saying that basically, Inbound means you pass a value in. Out means you're going to pass a value out. In out means whatever's in this slot can be changed and it will be passed back out as a value. So it's more or less passed by reference. It's not by reference, but it's the closest thing you, you have in a normal programming language. So we've defined our procedure. If it worked, it says zero is affected. 
Here's what's cool. You don't know if your code's actually good or not. It didn't compile it. Didn't even try to run it. It just says, hey, delimiter starts here, delimiter ends there, we created a procedure. Does it know if the code's good or not? It has no idea. So then you change the delimiter back so that everything goes back to normal. So we set the delimiter back to the semicolon. And then we call it. So we can go call space update salary one, call update salary two, call update salary three. And what it'll do is it'll run that update statement for each of those departments individually. And we will, I don't know why there's a green box. Apparently, uh, Brightspace is having a, uh, not Brightspace, uh, PowerPoint's having a problem with that slide. I had that problem last semester and I fixed it. Uh, then PowerPoint updated. So apparently it's not fixed anymore. Anyways, it's not important because what's important is what's above the green box. So you can see that the, the tour procedure updated all three departments and it gave us, you know, total values. So in the future, if we want to know how much we each department is paying for salaries, we could query this table with a summarized view. Now, if you work for a small company with like 50 employees, there's no value to do something like this. I'll admit it right now. However, if you do it for a big organization, like, I don't know, the government of Canada, they have a lot of employees. Uh, this You can't run this query real time. So you'd do something like this. Okay, so there is a command called um, show procedure status. And it basically shows you the names of the stored procedures. It doesn't show you the code. There's another way of doing it, which is called using an IDE. Um, it really sucks trying to, the, the best way to, re, to update a stored procedure is to drop it and recreate it. So you keep your code in whatever editor you've got, copy, paste, copy, paste, copy, paste, or, you know, have it, or use the IDE that connects and allows you to pull it out of the database. And if you want to get rid of procedure, it's a drop procedure with the name, just like drop table. So drop is very straightforward. Okay. So a few things about the stored procedures. Uh, you can declare variables. So you can have your own variables in there to your heart's content. You can use flow control. You guys have experienced if then else in Python or at least something equivalent thereof or the uh, JavaScript funness that is if then else if. Um, anybody in here ever write, write a bash script? If not, you're going to be learning it soon enough or you should just learn it by now. Um, bash is the scripting language for Linux, the default scripting language on most Linux installs. It's not a good time. MySQL also supports something nifty called a cursor. That's suddenly where we get out of the normal programming type stuff and we delve into uh, significantly more powerful things. Um, so to learn more about server procedures, there's a link. Um, I, I, this link actually used to point to the MySQL documentation until I realized that the MySQL documentation was um, crap. I mean, it's good. It's detailed, and you almost need an engineering degree to understand it. MySQLTutorial.org, on the other hand, does a fantastic job of covering it in simple language. So when you go to do the lab, that's probably a good spot to uh, jump into. Okay, so we're going to redo the same sort of procedure, but this time we're going to use something called a cursor. So. The first step the example does is we reset everything to zero. The problem with the previous one is you had to manually call the store procedure for every department one at a time. Great, if you've got three departments. Once again, go to a very large organization with thousands of employees. They probably have a lot of departments. And if you had a new department, somebody needs to know they need to run the procedure on that department. Not a good plan. So. We're going to use a cursor. Now the code's significantly longer. Um, I'm going to zoom into the middle in a second, but you can see we reset the delimiter at the beginning, double dollar sign. We are dropping the procedure 
if it already exists. And <clears throat> you'll notice that since we already changed the uh, delimiter, the drop procedure is actually terminated by two dollar signs, just for shits and giggles. Um, we're not going to create a new procedure, update salary, but you notice there's no more parameters because we wanted to do it for all departments. All right, so I'm going to zoom in a bit and scroll around. At the very top, we're declaring a bunch of things. So how do you declare a variable in MySQL's programming language? Use the declare keyword. Shocking. And it looks a lot like how you define a column in a table. You go define, done, it's an integer, defaults to zero. Here we're going to declare the current department number as an integer. Now, the next two are the weird ones. We're going to declare dnum cursor, so department number cursor, as a cursor for, and then if you take a look at everything that's after the word for, you'll see that it's an SQL statement. Select the department number from department salaries. The next one is the fun one. Every other database server I've ever worked with can handle the fact that it reached the end of records. MySQL is special. It goes, I need to know what to do when I can't find a database record. So we declare a continue handler. Literally, declare continue. So the variable is called continue. It's a handler for not found. So set done equal to one. So essentially what's going to happen is if it can't find any more records, it's going to set the variable called done equal to In Python, you've probably seen something like this called try catch fail. You try it catches, and then it fails. In MySQL, you actually have to declare a try-catch handler at the top. So it's going to try to do it until it can't do it no more. So that's our four variables we've declared. Now, we are going to open the cursor. So opening the cursor is the equivalent of you saying select star from, or select department number from department salary. It executes the command, but it doesn't do anything with it yet. Uh, have you guys learned about how to loop through records in Python yet? So you know how in Python you declare your SQL statement, then you execute it, and then you do... Now, if we were talking PHP, I could tell you really easily what the command is. I'm not a Python developer. But basically you're doing the equivalent of a, for, uh, a while loop while you pull the next record, do this. And if it fails to pull it, it returns a false, therefore the while loop ends. MySQL is too stupid to be able to do that. So they created that handler. So we're going to open the cursor. Then we're going to start a repeat until done. This is the equivalent of a do while. Not a while do, a do with while at the end. So we're going to repeat until done. Literally, there's a variable called done. And until done is no longer equal to zero, it's going to keep tracking along because zero is false. We're going to fetch the department denum curse. What happens is it's going to grab the first row or fetch a row into current denum because it returns one column. it's going to fetch it into that one variable. If we had two columns, we could fetch it to two variables, common limited list. So it's going to say, okay, pull the first row out of denum, grab that first column and shove it into current de department number. Then we run the update command, which looks exactly like what we had in the previous one where we this and set this up. But this time it's using the value from the cursor until done. So then it'll go, okay, we're going to try pulling it again. Worked great. We're going to try pulling it again. Oh, that worked. We're going to try pulling it again. Oh, no, there's nothing else for us to pull. Wait. If it fails, we're going to set done equal to one, and it slides through the rest, and it ends. Then the repeat ends. We close the cursor, and we end the procedure. 
it's a fairly straightforward concept where we say, hey, we're going to open a query. We're going to loop through the query until we can't find any more records. And if for every record we find, we'll update the, the salaries table. That's the plain English version of what's happening on the screen. And then we reset our delimiter because we're good little programmers. And then we can go call update salary, and it just does it all in one call. We never need to know how many departments we have because it loops through them. Okay, so we're going to create a procedure to give a raise to all employees. And this one here, we'll go through it really quick, but it's basically the exact same thing. Um, this time we're changing the delimiter to a pipe because, you know, just to show you guys, it can, it can be whatever the heck you want it to be. Um, we're going to create a give raise. We're going to pass in a double. Basically, it's a um, percent. So, you know, it's a value of a percentage. Um, we're going to declare our wonderful done variable again because it can't handle a, a improper pull. Uh, we're going to declare the employee ID, the salary. And in this case, the cursor is for two columns. So we're going to select ID and salary from the employee. And our wonderful continue handler has been declared yet again. We're going to open up the employee record. We're going to repeat until done. And we're going to fetch the employee record into the employee ID and salary. So I declared two variables here. We're pulling two columns here, so we're able to fetch into two call into two variables. So there's two columns being pulled, it's being put into two variables. Please note, the number of columns must match the number of variables, and the number of variables must match the number of columns. If you have a mismatch, it may or may not work. Um, I know in MySQL 5.7, if you had fewer variables than columns, it would work. I'm not sure what eight does. Um, it's a little special. And then we update the salary and you can see it's a straightforward SQL statement, update employee, set the salary equal to the salary plus the round of salary times the amount where the ID is equal to EID and repeat. And then we end it. Now, honestly, this could be written as a single SQL statement that doesn't need a cursor. This one's just adding complexity to show you guys how to do a cursor. Because honestly, we could have just done update employee, set salary equal to a salary plus, and without needing knowing who the employee is, because it would just go through the whole table and just do everybody in one command. That's how I'd write it. But, you know, then you wouldn't have an example of multiple column fetch. Um, and then if we run it, it just gives everybody a raise. Now, a proper version of this function would not just update it, it would actually do an entry in a log table somewhere for audit purposes saying old salary, new salary, data changed, and who changed it. Because you don't want the database administrator giving everybody a raise for shits and giggles, right? He wants to give himself a raise, so he'll give everybody a raise so nobody notices that it happened. And you think I'm joking about somebody trying to do that. There's a reason audits, audit tables exist. Okay, so that's the stored procedure. Now I'm going to talk about functions. So, MySQL comes with many predefined functions. It comes as a shock, right, that there's functions in MySQL. The thing is that we can create them ourselves. So by creating our own functions, we can extend the capabilities of our database server. Some functions you may have already experienced. Length, sum. Uh, I don't know, min, max, uh, replace, uh, LPAD, RPAD, trim. All useful SQL functions that you've probably all experienced uh, at some point. Um, but we can create our own functions. Now, functions are compiled at runtime. So every time the function is called, it compiles it. It's not like the store procedure that's pre-compiled. It needs to figure out what it's going to do every time. Functions must have a return type and can only return one value. That sounds familiar. Can only support select statements. So you can only use it in a select statement. You can't call a function. You use it as part of select instead. 
um, can handle input parameters, but does not have output parameters. So you can pass a value in, it will return a value, but it won't pass values back out. It theoretically can't be used in a transaction. Um, your mileage may vary on that one. Then I'll call a stored procedure. And it can be used in a join clause because it's just a function used as part of your select statement. And um, this slide is wrong. This bottom part here is wrong for the most part. Uh, so function, function name, you pass in the parameters, you tell it what it's returning. Now, there's an important one where it says not deterministic, and I'll explain to you guys in a minute what it does. Begin, end, and the parameters is literally the parameter name and the type. So I'd rather just do an example. Wow, this one's brutal. Um, it's not liking the screen resolution at all. So we got our employees. We're gonna change our delimiter because when you create a function, it's the same rule as a procedure. Create function, give raise, old value, amount, should be a parentheses if it's been cut off by the wonderful scaling, returns a double. It's deterministic. Now I'm gonna, I think this slide later explains what it is. We'll explain what deterministic or not deterministic means now. When a function is deterministic, and that's something you guys have probably never heard before the, the today. A function that is deterministic means it will always return the same value if a parameter is fed in the same way. So if you feed in one and one, it will always give you the same value even if you run it a thousand times. If it's not deterministic, it means that, so basically if it's deterministic and it sees the same parameters in that same session, so you connect it, you run it a couple of times, every time it sees the same parameters, if it's seen it before, it doesn't even run the code. It just says, I've seen this before, here's your answer. It's to make it go faster because it doesn't need to compile the code. It doesn't need to do the SQL statements inside of it. It just says, if somebody said the door is blue, and then 10 seconds later, somebody says, hey, the door is blue. You don't need to look at the door because you say the door is blue. The first time you said, is the door blue? And you look at it and you go, yeah, the door is blue. The second time, you know, a few seconds later, somebody says, is the door blue? You don't need to look at the door because you already know because you've already checked it. And then it begins, it declares a new value set new val equal to old whatever the math is, and it returns the new value. So you'll notice uh, something new again in here, which is the set keyword. Set is how you set a variable. So in Python, you're probably used to just going variable equal whatever. In this, you actually have to say, hey, we're changing the value. Um, now, has anybody in here ever seen the basic programming language? You have to be old. Basic was the uh, original easy language. That's what our introductory courses were when I went through college, 27 years ago, 28 years ago. Um, Commodore 64, Amstrad's, you know, they all had basic on it. The old PCs all had quick basic on it. You could run your, your own little programs and on your PC in DOS in Quick Basic. And in basic, how do you set a variable? You use the set keyword. So somebody figured that, you know, the MySQL language should look a lot like basic because it's, you know, easy. Therefore, it's basic. So you set the variable. Um, other database servers don't use the set keyword. They use a different way of assigning the variable value. Instead of an equal sign, it uses a colon equal. That's what Oracle and Postgres does. Why? Because their languages are modeled after another language called Pascal. <laughs> um, well, they're writing languages. They say, well, we're going to model on something that already exists. Why make people relearn everything? So, you know. So, see, I just said it. There's a slide about deterministic, and I already just covered it. 
Uh, this is the official de definition. Um, so not deterministic means two plus two is always equal to four. There's no chance of getting anything other than four. Um, not deterministic means that um, when it's possible that even if you feed it the same values, something else may come out. Uh, a good example of that would be a dice roll function where you want to have a random number. So you say, I want you to run a 2D20, right? So I want you to roll two versions of a, a random number between one and 20. Every time you run it, it should give you something theoretically different. It's possible to give you the same value, but if you determined stick and you did 220, it would always give you the same value. After the first run, it caches the results. Okay. Um, so what's the difference between a function and a stored procedure? Functions are compiled at runtime. Stored procedures are pre-compiled. Tends to make them a little bit faster. The functions can only be used in a select statement. Store procedures can be used pretty much anywhere. Um, a function can only ever return one value. A store procedure can return, cannot return a value, but it can re have multiple output values via parameters. Um, functions only have inbound parameters. Store procedures do in and out. A function behaves like a method. So in Python, you create a function, you create a method, my, uh, a function in a database runs basically the same way. The sort of procedure is more like a script. Usually you use it for maintenance tasks more than anything else. Um, functions can be used in a join. Store of procedures cannot because you can't call a store of procedure. I mean, you, can, you can't use the keyword call in a select statement. So you can't use call procedure in a select statement. Therefore, you can't use it in a join. Um, technically, functions can't be used in transactions. Store procedures can contain transactions inside of them. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, yeah. So a function and the store procedure contained inside the database, they have to have a unique name inside that database. If you have five databases on your machine, Theoretically, you could have the same function in each one of them. But they're defined per database. So you could have the same function name, but different behavior, which is not ideal, because then it's confusing. But in theory, yes, that's exactly how it works. That the functions and the uh, store procedures are included with it. Um, yeah. That's over it. So. For those that aren't here, because I'm missing like half the class, um, somebody just asked me, when you do a backup, does it include the functions or procedures? The answer is yes. It's only, the other, what's the point of doing a backup? All right. So it's generally more desirable to use stored procedures over functions because they allow more operations and they're significantly more uh, flexible depending on what you want to do. They run faster because they're pre-compiled. Um, if it's a simple task that you're thinking is a one-off or two-off or, you know, once in a blue moon, a function might do the job just fine. Um, it just depends on what you need to do with it. Okay. So that's functions and stored procedures. It looks like a lot of stuff to take in until you try to do it. Then you realize that once you translate what you do in Python into whatever this language is, by the way, anybody want to take a guess what the language is called for MySQL? You ready? It's called runtime. Literally, the guys at MySQL created the store procedure language and the function language were so creative, they called it the runtime language. Oracle calls theirs PLSQL, procedure language. SQL. Microsoft SQL Server has two languages. ASQL stands for Transact SQL and C Sharp. Postgres, being the most advanced free database server on earth, gives you the choice of like 14 languages. They have PLTCL, an old language known as Tickle, literally, TCL is known as Tickle. PLP, 
PG SQL. So what's cool about PL PG SQL, it's 90% compatible with Oracle. So you can take the functions from Oracle, paste it in Postgres, do a few adjustments and bam, you're on your way to migrating off Oracle. It's got PL Perl. You can write your functions in Perl. PL Python. You can write your functions in Python. Uh, I've seen PL Java. If you need to do heavy duty enterprise stuff, you can write your functions and procedures in Java. I would not recommend it because of the performance hit, but if you need some, do some really complicated crap that needs like special Java libraries. Um, I've seen PLV8, PLJS, PL Node, PLR. For anybody in here know what R is? Go ahead. It's for statistical analysis. PLR is for stats. So you can actually get the database server to do your stats math and for you instead of spending uh, $10,000 a use like SAS charges you for that exact same functionality. And on and on and on, the number of languages is insane that you have. Um, the other cool thing about Postgres as language is a uh, Python and Perl can run in trusted and untrusted mode. When it is a untrusted language, which sounds kind of weird, allows you to do operating system calls. So from inside the database server, you can delete files on the disk. And I just, yeah, I just watched him go, what? Now imagine you're a guy developing a web app, person developing a web app. And you've discovered that your programmers suck. And what's happening is it lets you upload a file to the web server. You're being a little citizen. You're not putting it as a blob. You're going to put it as a file on disk and you store a pointer to the file, like a file name, right? And a path. When the person deletes the file, they delete database entry, but they leave it on the disk because that's useful. You could theoretically, you know, write code that when the row gets deleted, it actually reaches out and nukes the file off the disk for you. Uh, I have used it so I could do calls from one server to another server. <clears throat> like there's certain things I needed to copy to another server somewhere else in the enterprise. And we couldn't modify the application anymore. The application, our license for the application, sorry, we could still use the application, but our development license has expired, so we could no longer make changes to that application. There's, you know, companies that actually give you user licenses and developer licenses, and, you know, a user license might be $300 a year, developers like 30 grand a year. So when it expires and you've done everything you need to do, you don't make those changes, we figured out we could do it with a with a, an untrusted uh, Python call from the database server to another machine. Nifty stuff. Um, MySQL, on the other hand, it just plays inside itself. It's probably safer that way. <laughs> uh, but it's cool functionality, though. Okay. And now for triggers. So, so far we talked about store procedures and functions. They're fairly straightforward concepts. One's a script, one's a function. It's like a method in your script. A trigger is an event-driven action. Now, most of you take stuff that's called event-driven for granted. When I was going through school, event-driven programming was like the new darling. Nobody had ever done it before. Like it was a brand new thing. Like they offered a course as an additional credit because it wasn't part of the curriculum that you could take at night because my school didn't have night courses. So if you wanted to get this extra credit, you had to go to school at night, which really sucked if you're on the bus in North Bay. Um, bus service at night was amazing. Like one bus an hour. Um, and a new language had just come out. It was like, the coolest shit ever at that point in time. So this would have been 1994, 1995. Can anybody think of what new language appeared about that time? That would have been the best thing since sliced bread. And there's not enough old people in this room. Visual Basic. 
had just come out. What was cool about it is you could draw your UI and assign actions to buttons and drop downs. And so, you know, value in the drop down changes. Poof. You make an action. Somebody clicked on the button. Poof. An action happens. That sounds a bit like what you guys are doing in your web pages, right? You got a web page, you got a button, somebody clicked on the button. That's known as event driven programming. You react to certain events. Database servers, <coughs> good database servers, um, even bad database servers now, basically all have something called triggers. Triggers are event driven actions. There are six moments that can be captured in most database servers. So 98%, no, okay. 100% of databases that support triggers will support these six moments. More powerful database engines will support more than these six moments. The six moments have two timings and three events. Insert, update, and delete are the events. The timing is before or after. So depending on the server, uh, the trigger may or may not be supported by the transaction. I'll get to that in a moment, what I mean by that. Um, okay, so insert, update, and delete. So those are the events that trigger, that, if, that drive the triggers. As soon as these commands are executed, a listener ensures that trigger runs. So essentially it's going, oh, they're running an update on the employees table. <laughs> Do we have any triggers? Yes or no? And then it, it figures out which ones need to be run. Okay, so our six events and moments are as listed. Before insert, before the data is inserted into the table, after insert, the data has been written to the table. It's committed. It can't be changed, but it's something that you have after the insert happens. So this could be used for logging purposes. That's what most of the after triggers are for. Before data is updated, before update is before the data is updated, after update is after it's updated. Uh, before delete and after delete, same thing. Before you nuke it, after you've nuked the data. Now, some people are wondering, well, what's the point of an after trigger on delete? Is you deleted one row, maybe you need to do some cleanup elsewhere in the database. So after the delete succeeds, you're going to go and do some cleanup, or you're going to log the fact that the record was deleted and what was the old value that was there. That kind of stuff. Um, interesting. Um, if these events do not occur, so if there's no insert, update, or delete, the trigger won't execute. So if you're not doing an insert and update, delete, trigger won't fire. This is the difference between a function or, or a procedure is the only time the code will execute is if you are literally triggering it. So going back to your JavaScript on a web page, you have an event tied to the OK button on the form. If the person ever clicks on the OK button, will it ever fire the code tied to the OK button? <laughs> Theoretically, no. <clears throat> Theoretically, yes, because it's JavaScript and it does weird things. But usually the answer is no. Um, so you got to be aware, though, that sometimes there are statements that happen in the background that could actually trigger those events. For example, uh, load data and the replace command, which is something you guys have never been taught. Um, those are commands people can run to do bulk loads from files on the disk. It uses the insert command. So if you're running a load data command, it's going to fire off an insert for every row in the load data. So you may need to disable the trigger before you do a load data. All right. So there's a specific series of events that happen. There's a chart in a second. Um, however, we have two special things that get created every time a procedure runs. A good marker. So we have before, after, and 
we have inserts, update, and delete. Okay, so her, here's our happy little matrix. So when we do an insert, we will have the new. Actually, I don't even need to have uh, before or after, really. Um, I'm just going to go down the middle here for starters, and I'll explain what happens to it. Um, we have new. So what new means is it's the data that's part of the insert statement. So you go insert into employees, and then the values. That's what's contained in new. On the update, we have new and old. So you're going to do an update, so you're changing a record. The new contains the values being pushed in. Old has what was there before. So before it actually fires off the actual write to the table, it actually pulls the old values and stores them in memory. So it has a copy for a moment in time. And on delete, we only have old. Okay? Because if you're deleting, we're not putting anything new in the database. Therefore, where would we have new? It just keeps track of what's there. So here's the difference, though. So again, even after, we'll still have the same things. Actually, no, this one's just old. Like this. However, man, I wish I had a different colored marker. In before, new is read-write. You can change the values of new. So before you insert, you can actually change some of the values if you want. You can override whatever's being passed in. So new is read-write. New is read-write. Guess what? Old is always read-only. And it's read only. After is read only. Why? Because it's already been applied to the disk. It's too late. Um, a good example of how this works. Um, normally, I get people to come and stand in front of the class, but because I'm recording, I'm not going to do it. So imagine we've got three people. We actually, yeah, we got three people. Person one receives a, a message. Say, I say, hey, I want you to keep track of number five. Person two, which is the before trigger, changes five to six. He says to the person the, the in-between personnel can write it to the piece of paper saying, hey, now the value is six. Can the last person change the value that's on the piece of paper? No, because it's been written in ink. That's why it's read-only after it's been written to the disk. So new and old behave like, like an object. So you can refer to any of the columns being passed in and or is currently being updated by going new.column name or old.column name. It's cool beans. All right, here's the chart, which is going to be impossible to read in the class. I know it is. That's why it's in the slides, so you can happily enjoy that. But I'm going to zoom in a little bit so I can try to do it. All right, so every time, it's shocking just how much happens every time you run a command, eh? And so SQL command is received by the SQL interpreter. It says, is it a manipulation command? Is it changing the data, yes or no? No, it runs the query because they're not changing anything. And, ooh, PowerPoint, come on, don't do this to me. Um, basically, it executes the query, returns the results. Is it a manipulation? And yes. All right, so when it does this, okay, it's an update or an insert command. Did it parse correctly? Yes or no? No, it goes to the red box of failure. Yes, it's good. So then it goes, okay, what table are we modifying? 
and then goes, oh, is there a before trigger? Yes or no? No, it just skips. Yes, it executes the trigger. It says, did the trigger succeed? In other words, did it run? Yes or no? No, red box a failure. Yes, it continues. So then it executes the command, which involves writing stuff to the disk. It says, did it execute correctly? No, red box a failure. You can see what's happening here, right? Every time it's a no, it's the red box. And it goes, yes, it, we were able to write the stuff to the disk. Is there an after trigger? Executes the after trigger. Did it work? Yes or no? Then it outputs the results. Okay, so remember earlier when I said, depending uh, that it might be transaction safe? MySQL and transactions are not friends. What happens is with MySQL, actually, I'll back up the truck. With Microsoft SQL Server, Oracle, and Postgres, and I'm sure IBM DB2 and some of the others, the entirety of the execution is part of the SQL. Begin transaction. Or if you're doing implicit transactions, you just ignore the begin keyword and you just do an update or an insert. And the before trigger works, great. It writes the stuff to the disk, great. The after trigger works, great. It succeeded. With those database systems, the before trigger worked. No, error message, nothing has happened, right? Transaction rolls back. Before trigger worked, yes. Did the insert, update, or delete work? Yes, great. It gets written to the disk. The after trigger fails. It goes, oh, this failed. It rolls back the whole thing like it never happened. So the insert goes away, the before trigger goes away, everything goes away. In MySQL, on the other hand, before trigger worked, great. It manages to write it to the disk, great. The after trigger fails, great, it failed. It tells you, I couldn't do this, but the stuff stays written to the disk because the insert was successful or the update or the delete was successful. As far as MySQL is concerned, everything up to the after trigger is transaction safe. After the insert, after the insert, update, or delete, it care. So with MySQL, you cannot assume that the after trigger is transaction safe because it is not. Uh, maybe they fixed it in the latest build of whatever we're running because some people are running 8.03, uh, 8.022. Some people are at 8.3. Some are in 8.2. Your behavior may change. Maybe they've improved it. I am taking the time to figure it out because we don't use MySQL where I work. And I'm not going to go out of my way to figure that out. Uh, we use real database servers um, that I'd use for money. Um, so you have to be aware with trans with triggers that depending on the database engine, they're not trigger they're not transaction safe in the sense that a failure does not roll back the whole transaction. It might just roll back to the insert because the insert worked. It considers the transaction successful. Now. That having been said, if you actually do an explicit begin and commit, MySQL, at least last I heard, may be better behaved. So if you explicitly begin a transaction and then you roll it back as an error message happened, you're probably safe. But if you're using implicit uh, transactions, excuse me, so dry in here. So if you're using, like I said, um, implicit transactions, in other words, you're like you would like when you're writing your Python code where you don't, you know, actually do a begin and a commit and just doing insert, update, delete, those are not going to be trigger safe. Just so you're aware, that's one of the risks. Okay, advantages of triggers. They can be used to catch errors. That'd be the before insert. So you can actually do some validation before the database gets changed. You can use it as a way of scheduling tasks. Um, place I was working at, we actually did that for updating the, the uh, materialized views because it's a web application. 
And it was being deployed in a cluster. That means that any of the servers could be doing its happiness. We actually had um, a command that would run on the very first insert into the login log. So login log, when record's going in, it's the first one since midnight, it would run the materialized view update. The world's cheapest scheduler. Right, so it's as if you're saying, okay, the very first person to walk in the door, we're going to take out all the garbages. We can ignore everybody else after the first person coming in the door. That's, you know, a cheap way of scheduling stuff. Um, it's a good way of keeping changes of, to the data logged for auditing. And you can do data integrity checks so that, you know, you delete an order, you can make sure that you need to go through and clean out other things like... Um, Allocate inventory allocations, or you know, maybe it generated serial numbers, and you don't want those serial numbers to hang around after the order's canceled or deleted because you know, put some places in order and you were just about to send it to them, they cancel their transaction and they want a refund. You don't want those serial numbers floating around, so you could theoretically just yank them out of the database with the trigger. Triggers have disadvantages, as cool as they are. There's a few different issues. One, it adds overhead. Every time you do an insert, it's got to run the, the, the appropriate triggers around it. Every time you do an update, you got to do the appropriate triggers. That means you're running more code. It can add latency, make things a little slower. And since it's based on what the client feeds it, and, you know, web app, desktop application, whatever, it may not have all the information. It's operating a little blind, right? It only knows what's happening at that moment. Um, so triggers. Cannot execute the following statements in MySQL. So this is MySQL only. As you can see, the big green, this applies to MySQL. Show, load, uh, backup, restore flush, return, transact. You can't put triggers on those. Um, they can't be used in transactions. The other statements that do implicit commits, as I just explained. So start, commit, rollback. They'll work, but may not guarantee. Lock tables, unlock, blah, blah, blah. Uh, that's also covered. Um, also cannot call a store procedure or function. So a trigger can't call a store procedure. Because you can't. Uh, in a minute, I've got a couple of slides that show examples of how to make the triggers. Um, other database servers actually allow you to create triggers on DDL. You can actually have a trigger that fires off when you create a table. Or when you drop a table, you alter a table, you can actually have a trigger that fires off to log who made those changes somewhere else. Cool stuff. Okay, so what's the syntax like? Create trigger, trigger name. You define the time and the event on what table. Now, for each row, um, I'll explain to you guys what that does in a moment. And then you do the actions. So the trigger time is before or after. The event is insert, delete, or update. You should give all triggers a unique name. Some database servers um, care a lot, as in you can only have a trigger with the one name throughout the entire structure. Other database servers the name is locked to the table. So you can have the same trigger name on multiple tables. But some you can't. Okay. So here's an example of an after trigger. You will notice the very first thing. We change our delimiter. Just like store procedures and functions. Why? Because we're writing code. So create trigger. Product serial number log. After update. So this thing, this trigger is called you know, product serial number log. Great. It's going to happen after a table is updated on table called products for each row. Now I'm going to explain what for each row means. For each row is an optional part of the definition. There's two styles of triggers. A What they call global trigger and a row specific trigger. A global trigger happens 
once. So even if you do an update, um, let's say in this case, we go the update salary example we did earlier, where we update everybody's salary. If you don't use for each row, it'll fire that trigger once, no matter how many rows are being modified in that one statement. For each row means for every row being changed, you need to fire off this trigger. Um, rarely in my career have I used a global type trigger where it runs just once for the whole call. Because normally I want to keep track of what the changes are on a row by row basis. So the catch is though, for each row is where store, uh, triggers start getting expensive. Table has a million rows and you're being lazy and you do an update and you forget the where clause and it's going to update every row. That means that if you have a million rows, it's going to execute the contents of that trigger 1 million times. Simple triggers, fantastic. Complex triggers, not so cool. Um, this was actually a simple trigger that's a little bit expensive. So it's going to fire off for every row that it's changed, whether it's a single row update or a multi-row update, every row that changes will fire off the internal code. We have our begin and our end blocks. If old serial number is not equal to new serial number, then. When I was saying earlier that this looks a lot like basic, like literally, that's how you'd write an if statement in basic. So if the old serial number is not equal to the new serial number, so after the update has happened, it's checking to see if the serial number of the project has changed. If it has not, if it has changed, then it inserts into the log. The ID name, serial number, type, series of values, and you can see that it's inserting the old ID, the old name, the old serial number, how, which is literally like what's the moment, the timestamp for right now, and then what is the code that was run, and if, then it ends the store, the the trigger. <clears throat> so what this is doing is saying. If the serial number changed, we want to keep track of what the old one was. So we actually have history of the serial number changes. Um, now, there's a story behind this example. Um, my old job, years ago, uh, we had a uh, fella who was using an anonymous proxy in the Netherlands to uh, abuse our product registration system. And this was a long, long time ago before, you know, web application security was really a big thing. Like, you know, people put up a web page, they go, ah, there's no bad people out on the internet. And they just left it out there, you know, there's no sanitation, there's no checking, blah, blah, blah. So one day, um, I get a call. The person goes, Dan, serial numbers are changing in the database. I'm like, because yeah, 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 they're changing, like really fast. And these are things that have sh been shipped out for like years. They shouldn't be changing anymore because the company I worked for used physical hardware dongles. Dongles not plugged in, software doesn't run. So we write those serial numbers to the database once. Sometimes we'd ship out the product without, like we'd ship a dongle without knowing the serial number. And when the application ran the first time, it would transmit to us the serial number. Dude bro coming out of the Netherlands had figured out the message packet type and he started literally looping row one, serial number this, row two, serial number that. Because what it does is every time you change the serial number, it would give you a fresh license file. License file was encrypted. He was trying to, and how do you, how do you figure out how to crack encryption? Anybody know how to crack encryption? You feed it a known value. So if you feed it a known value and it comes back and you see a pattern, you can start cracking the encryption. Dude was feeding known values one after another, trying to figure out if he could get a repeating pattern coming out of the encrypted files. Never would have worked. Just, just saying, it never would have worked because we were actually putting in random string at the start of the license file. So the, 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 you could actually ask for the same file 25 times, it would look different 25 times. So, but dude was trying his best. So we banned the Netherlands as a country, until we fix this problem. We did find out we only had four customers in the Netherlands, so it wasn't really a big impact to anybody. Um, and they stayed banned for about nine months. 
Um, so what happened is I wrote a store procedure in our products. It's very similar to this. It's not exactly the same as this, uh, but it was very similar to this where we were, every time a serial number changed on a product, I was logging it when it happened, what the IP address that triggered it was. And it wasn't in MySQL, it was in Postgres. Postgres has a really cool function called um, uh, uh, curcom. So it's a function. It returns the command that actually fired off the trigger. So then I could actually see this, the update statement. So then I could go through the code to figure out what in the code was triggering that update statement. So then I could figure out how dude's getting at it. So then I started tracking the changes to the database and what commands were firing it off. So that, and then we unblocked it and I thought I fixed the hole and dude found a new hole like three days later. So I spent about four years playing cat and mouse with this person. But the good news was every time we discovered that he was doing it, I could just bring the serial numbers back from the backup. And it helped me figure out what was going on. Um, yeah, four years of code hardening. It was a fun time. Um, just a little bit of overtime at that point. But this example is a real world example of a trigger I ran, I wrote in Postgres, but I wrote this tr the almost identical trigger. Uh, it's cool. You know, a bit of history of why, what a good use for a trigger is. Um, so in MySQL, you can also raise an error. So this trigger is before delete because you don't want anybody to be able to delete data out of the products log, right? You're logging data in that table. You don't want anybody to be able to go delete the data. Why? Because what's the point of a log if somebody can run a command to clean it out, right? For each row, it says begin. And MySQL is really stupid. There's no nice raise error message. It's signal, SQL state, 45,000. That means it's a error message. And there's a bunch of different, different values for that. Set message text equal to no, 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 no deleting. Okay, so what would happen is when the delete fails because this is before delete, it returns an error message and it literally causes the end to crash. You know when you run a bad command in SQL and it says, dude, what are you doing? That that's literally what it's doing. It's saying, hey, dude, you're not allowed to delete TFB. You're done playing now. And that's how you actually raise error messages. You can use a single state for debugging. And for those of us that are of certain vintage, we remember back when we didn't have debuggers for web applications, where literally it was print here, print here one, print here two, as you're walking through the code to figure out where it's crashing. So you get like here one, here two, and you never make it to here three. The failure is somewhere between here two and here three, right? And you can do the same thing where you can put output to the log. So you can raise warnings or notices instead of errors and actually output log content. Uh, my example next week will have some of that in it. Okay, so that's stored procedures and triggers. Technically, that's every, this is everything you guys need for the last two labs. Um, those examples are very close to what you need for the labs. So the hardest part will be when you first run it and you get weird errors, you gotta figure out what those errors mean. That's part of the joy of learning how to write this stuff. I'm pretty sure almost nobody in this room ran our first Python program with no errors. You had to learn what those errors meant. Good luck. Uh, my skills extra special that way. Um, but yeah, so we, as of now, officially have reached the end of the content for this course. Yay, no, no nothing to memorize. Next week will be the review for the exam, and I'll actually do some practical examples of the triggers. So you guys can actually see, and, and some functions. So I'll be spending like the lab sitting down typing uh, instead of standing up here and pacing. Um, so you can actually see how some of this stuff works. Uh, the example I usually use is a uh, inventory allocation system. And I'll explain what that is next week for those of you that don't know what an inventory allocation system is. Um, 
Outside of that, I recommend that you do, you try to do the last two labs pretty much in one go. Because once you figure out the errors, when you create the function, you figure out how to fix those errors, but the store procedure and the trigger is pretty much going to be the same. You know, once you figure out what the errors are, it's just going to go faster. Instead of, I'm going to do one, then take four days off, and suddenly it's just gone. Just do it all in one go. Um, it'll go better for everybody. Um, so, yeah, outside of that, that's it for today.